My name is Emmanuel Halawali. I'm a Nigerian American. My name is Nancy Payan, and I'm from Korea. My parents were born and raised in Indonesia. I'm from India. I'm originally from Russia. We came to the United States because of uh, racial discrimination. We were Jewish and had to flee the Nazi regime. We actually came to the United States because of the Vietnam War. It was because of political unrest that was happening in Nigeria. Because I need betterment for my children. It was not safe. Spent three years with his father in a prisoner of war. They used to like just hide at, during the day and only travel at night. We were completely cut off from our family and friends in Italy. On the boat, we were actually robbed by pirates. So they came here to, to seek freedom from oppression. To celebrate. To celebrate. To celebrate who we have been. Who we have been and to understand who we are now. Who we are now. We look at the history and the lives of our new Americans. Of our new Americans. <laughs> next. 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 On Columbus Neighborhoods. On Columbus Neighborhoods. On Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... Since 1921, the State Auto Group has called Columbus Neighborhoods home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. American Electric Power Foundation, a resource for charitable initiatives and communities served by AEP and beyond to improve people's lives through education, basic needs, healthcare, and the arts. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you. Thank you. More than a hundred languages are spoken in Columbus. Spanish, Somali, Nepali, Arabic, Chinese for sure. Have you ever heard of Mumbai? We've got that one too. One in six residents in the metro area is a first or second generation immigrant. We have the second largest population of Somalis in the entire country. Since 2003, we've welcomed more than a thousand refugees every year from all over the globe. Namaste. Refugees are more than twice as likely as the general population to own a business in the city, and 900 foreign-owned businesses, that's refugees and immigrants, in the metro area employ more than 40,000 workers. And before you ask, yes, these numbers reflect legal residents of the United States, and most of them are already full-fledged citizens. How did all of these people get here, and why did they come? And how is Columbus weathering the change from a Midwestern crossroads into a global city? To get started, I want to introduce you to some of our new neighbors, our new Americans. Meet Soda Hussein Mohammed. She was a radio journalist in Mogadishu. When journalists were assassinated during the war in Somalia, she fled the country. You know, where I come from, people don't like women to be journalists or successful or in business or in power. So they would try to tell my mom not to let me 
do what I do, my mom would never listen. She'd be like, this is your life. You want to do this? It's up to you. You know, when you have a goal that you want to reach, there's nothing in your way can stop you because all my vision, my mind, everything was, I need to go, I need to get there. And I just put this, you know, idea in my mind that I could go to South Africa, learn a language, any language. But English was my priority. And I can, you know, report the Soccer World Cup 2010 because I always want to go to the World Cup. So I was on the radio like every minute for the 2010 World Cup from June to July. I'm a big fan of soccer, football, what we call. Oh, what do I like about soccer? Is there anything not to love? Meet Vim Bastola from the Bhutanese Nepali community. He's an accountant by trade, but owns a grocery store on Morris Road. One of the values that you already told, we are a family oriented. Family is the biggest binding institution. The other thing is that we value our elders and respect our elders very much. But more than that, we are a workaholic. I think it has to do with some kind of survival instinct they got carried from their camps. Back in the camps, people didn't have a lot of access going outside doing work. So what they did is, some of them, they set up small shops in their own houses in the huts. Tax preparation business is a seasonal thing. I said, well, what you do the other, other period? There's so many months, you know, nine, eight to nine months sitting idle is not a very good. So I uh, connected with my friends, relatives, and they said, well, yes, uh, let's do something. So we had that idea of grocery business. Helen Yi came to America to study English and supported herself by working in restaurants. My English name is Helen. I have my Chinese name is Guang Hongjiao. I plan to come here to study. After I come here, I face a lot of challenges. I work at the Chinese restaurant and uh, my friend owned this building. They said, Helen, it's time you open the restaurant. You already talked to open the restaurant, open the restaurant, now it's a chance. I just make a decision to start this one. My husband, he loved seeing the opera in his whole life. He want to go to the public to sing the opera. This is his dream. My husband, he don't speak English. This is a little problem, <laughs> you know, yeah. He just sing, you know. <laughs> I make a little food, and my husband makes a little food, plus we have chef. So we got a big menu to serve the American people, you know, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Ricardo Corral is an ENT surgeon and the director of the Division of the Skull Based Surgery at the James Cancer Hospital. Newsweek recently voted him one of the best doctors in the nation. What was the hardest part was the language. Speaking the, the English is, is, is not, doesn't come natural. I didn't consider myself fluent in the language. As for the first three or four months, I had to be translating back and forth from Spanish to English, and that was very rough. Then, of course, the culture is completely different. The food is completely different. You lose your, your network of friends and family, uh, and that didn't ma make it any easier. <laughs> uh, so things that before were easy, uh, it became quite a chore. And, and of course, you, you perceive that people think that you are silly or stupid or ignorant or all, all of the above, and that, uh, that adds to the, to the frustration and to the, to the uh, blow on your self-esteem. 
you know, at the same time, you, you see it as a challenge and you see it that you can uh, improve day to day and, and that does the opposite effect. All of a sudden, you, you feel that you can make it and that you can do anything you want. Hamida Shamseh came to the United States from Iran. She was the first traditional Muslim woman to study dentistry at OSU. I come from a religious background. My family all covers. Like, it wasn't mandatory. They were covering even when the Shah was around. And before I knew it, I was 14, and I came back here, and I was the only girl wearing a scarf at my high school. After that, I, you know, I did find Muslim friends in my college, and I just never, you know, kind of never felt singled out. I think maybe the first year of my high school was the only year that I've been in America that kind of felt like I had to struggle a little bit in the beginning to fit in. I love other people asking me. I've always felt like, I don't like the ones that look at you and don't say anything, but I always, throughout my school and all that, I've always loved the ones that walk up to me, can we ask you a personal question? Do you mind? You know, and I know where it's going. <laughs> Like, no, go ahead. I, I love that because then they know, you know, I'm just normal like you. And it's just how I look on the outside. The hardest part for me was she started in August with field hockey practices. <laughs> she, and that was the first time she was presenting herself with her scarf to her, you know, team and all that. And it was so hot and she had to wear her uniform, long sleeves under, leggings under her shorts and her, you know, scarf. And I just remember like when I dropped her off the first day, I'm like, can I come with you? She's like, no, no, no mom's coming. One, two, three, oh, CSG! I would always think that like, oh my gosh, high school field hockey is going to be so much worse. It's so much harder, but I love my team so much. It's just a lot better to have like people who are older than you so you can look up to them and just learn from the upperclassmen and my coaches are very nice and it's just been really fun so far. So they've got a team. Ina Kinney's family came in 1974. My family came to Columbus, Ohio from Moscow, Russia. And it was a, very much of a closed state. You know, the only way you could hear about things that were going on outside of Russia was for Radio Free Europe. We're Jewish. So in Russia, you know, after the communist rule, you know, Stalin, Lenin, uh, there was no religion in Russia. So any religions were persecuted against. My father was an engineer in former Soviet Union in Russia. My mother was a homemaker. She stayed at home, took care of the kids. As most immigrants that came out of the, you know, Russia at that time, highly, you know, educated, highly driven, wanted to have a better life for himself and his family. So my dad's first job was working at a junkyard because he couldn't speak English. So he was cleaning toilets, making $3 an hour, and was able to save money from that $3 an hour. And we saved money, and that was the whole purpose of life, is to save money so you could do better the next year, and do better the next year. So that was his first job. And it was tough, it was tough, especially when somebody comes from a position of power, of influence, and come to a new country and you start from nothing. But you know that, but you don't really know how hard it's gonna be on yourself, my father, my mother, and the entire family. Coming to the United States was not easy. And I want to say that it's not easy for all immigrants that come to the United States. You have to learn the new language. You have to learn the culture. You have to be able to assimilate. But at the same time, you got to find work. you got to figure out how you're going to feed your family, right? Refugees and immigrants are groups of people who want to settle in another country, a country different from their country of origin. And in Columbus, we receive both refugees and immigrants. But there are significant differences between these two groups. Immigrants come here to reunite with family or to get a job. Refugees are fleeing war or persecution. Violence, either political or personal, is the engine here.
Refugee status is based on persecution. Persecution based on uh, religion, uh, nationality, belonging to a certain group, political opinion. Every refugee has a refugee story, a story of persecution. And every refugee has his or her journey from how it all started and when they come here. In 1993, the average wait time in a refugee camp would be nine years. If somebody enters refugee camp right now, the average wait time is 17 years. 17 years, and only 1% of world refugees are offered resettlement in another country. So we have millions of um, displaced people around the world, and millions of uh, refugees and it's devastating and we cannot help all but we can help those that come here the most vulnerable because if you think about that only one percent of all world refugees offered resettlement those are the most vulnerable um, and they come here uh, some of them and they become part of our communities it's a long process, and I always say that refugees are the most vetted uh, immigrants because they have to go through a number of uh, security clearance before they are admitted to the country. Meet Madino Kali. She's a daycare worker here in Columbus. To escape from Somalia, she worked her way to Syria, then fled on foot. I started walking from Syria until I reached Turkey. My God, it was difficult. We went through rivers and mountains. We were walking for two days. We did not eat any food. We just walked. Then I went to Izmir. Then I took a boat. Then it was sprayed with bullets. The bullets hit my nephew. He died. The boat capsized in the middle of the sea. It capsized. It had a motor. I held on to the wooden side. We were rescued from the sea we were taken to a prison called Sharon. People from the United Nations came to see us. I was brought to America in six months. How are you guys? I am a um, resettlement caseworker, so my job is you know, work with the newly refugees when they come to the state, especially to Columbus, from the day they arrive until 90 days. So, like, before the families come, I have to, like, set up housing for them and then go to the airport the day they arrive. And then take them to the house, buy a cooked meal, do integration, bring them to the office, take them around for shopping. You know, basic life, what you need when you go to a new place. I love what I do now. I love helping people. I, because I was once like them. I have that reconnection. When I go to the airport, seeing someone arriving first day, it gives me the flashback every day. Like, oh, I remember. I did this, I did this. I'm telling a story to my client. Like, you see, now I'm, I've been in this state two and a half years. I have this job. I drive. I do this and this. You can do the same thing. So it helps that we have a connection. Usually I'm the first person they see when they come in the morning and I make sure that I'm always the first person they see when they come in the morning, morning. introduce myself. Good morning guys, good morning, namaste. I've learned to say good morning, yeah, come on in, come take on a in. seat, nice to see you. My name is Milga and in a lot of the different languages that we see, so I'm pretty good at it. Somali is my first language, I can say that one pretty well. I can say it in Arabic now, in Nepali. All right, I'm gonna need overseas packets and the children's vaccination records. 
All new arrivals that arrive to Franklin County come here to get their medical health screening. That's to identify any, any medical problems that they're having um, for their sake and the sake for, of public health and then to help them with it. Um, a lot of times we get folks that have never been to a doctor before, so we are usually their first medical encounter ever. Meet up by your shoulder. So last year we provided interpreters in 104 different languages. So it's very diverse um, and we meet the demand by providing on-site interpreters, telephone interpreters and video interpreters. I think interpreters are really key to providing a lot of the cultural uh, brokering uh, between the, the provider, who could be the physician or staff, and the patient. So part of our role as interpreters is to be able to sort of mitigate a little bit that interaction. Their health care has not been ideal. It's been sporadic and perhaps even really no health care until they're screened to come over and then uh, conditions may be diagnosed at that time and treated sort of at the last minute. Um, Living in a refugee camp, nutrition isn't ideal. Sometimes rations of food exist. Um, there have been refugees who have been injured, tortured, imprisoned. They have you know, same stresses, stressors in the rest of the population, as well as PSTD, which is they witness um, destruction of their property. They've been through um, oceans, um, they've seen a um, family member died in front of them, uh, rape, so many different, you know, problems. So it is really hard for people to seek treatment. You need to know that before the Somali refugees came to Columbus, before the Russians, there were the Canadians. Look at this area. It's called the Refugee Tract. The refugees were from British Canada and Nova Scotia who had helped colonists escape British rule during the American Revolution. Their possessions, their land, their homes were confiscated. Before the city of Columbus was even added to the map, we had already made room for refugees. By the 1840s, in reaction to large-scale immigration, primarily German and Irish, we saw the emergence of a new third party in American political life. It was the American Party. These folks opposed immigration. They saw the new immigrants as a challenge to their way of life. Part of this was due to the fact that a lot of the Germans and Irish coming across were Roman Catholic, and there weren't that many Roman Catholics in America at that point, and there was some fear in that regard. But it wasn't just religion. It was the fact that all these new people were coming in with their strange customs and ways of life which were challenging our customs and our way of life. We didn't like that very much, and so we rose in revolt against it. It wouldn't be the first time, it wouldn't certainly be the last, that you see this kind of reaction to large-scale immigration. Since about the mid-19th century, there was no such a thing as a resident visa. People arrived, and it was up to the states, curiously enough, to define who the citizen was. Later, that was converted. The federal government retained exclusive jurisdiction over that. But oftentimes, you arrived, and that was that. And in the case of our young Irish brothers uh, arriving in the 1860s, sometimes you got off the boat, and you were given a blue uniform and a rifle and sent to Gettysburg. It wasn't that long ago that we were immigrants, whether it was last generation or five generations when my grandfather came from Ireland. We were all immigrants, it's just a matter of when. This is a photograph of the first Chinese tea shop here in Columbus. We hear a lot about the Germans and the Irish, but the Chinese came too. So they uh, shipped in tea, and it was a huge success. That's how they get started, and then finally end up with the restaurant business. 
By the early 1900s, there are 40 Chinese-owned businesses in Columbus. Laundries, yes, and restaurants where you could get chop suey, a completely American dish, by the way. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act that restricted immigration partially due to the volume of workers shipped in while building the railroad. It left the Chinese that were here in legal limbo. Generations of Chinese were born here without a legal pathway to citizenship. In the years after the American Civil War, there is a massive wave of immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. This includes large numbers of persons from Russia, from Italy, and from most of the countries in Eastern Europe. And again, there's a reason for this. Again, the continuation of the philosophy of revolution, which sweeps across Europe through much of this period and continues well into the 19th century, followed by economic decline in many cases, drought, name it, force many people to look to America, and they come in one of the largest mass migrations in human history. By 1910, when the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church was built, there were 30 Greek families living in Columbus. According to tradition, the first priority of the men coming over was to get enough pay and work to fund the dowries of their sisters back home. With the rise of the large cities and the urban industrial complexes that begin to emerge, we begin to attract large numbers of people to the cities. Extraordinarily large numbers of folks, black and white, begin to migrate north and the African-American population in particular experiences what comes to be called the Great Migration. The Great Migration. Six million people came to the northern United States, not from another country, but from the South, to escape persecution, to escape poverty, and to educate their children. They were African-Americans who had no opportunities in the post-Reconstruction South. The African-American migration from the South to the North really represents one of the greatest internal mass migrations in world history. The intense segregation, the fact that people literally couldn't even be comfortable walking downtown or shopping or even attending church in their home community. We look at issues like lynching, so people who did try to fight back within their community were literally killed for their efforts and then later terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which is, after all, a terrorist group. I help to keep people in their place. They leave at the rate of 500 a day and 15,000 a month. And so by the time the 1930 has come, one third of Alabama's black population is living north already. And that's just Alabama. It really is more, I'm seeking freedom, I'm seeking economic ability, I'm seeking a safety, very much like the refugees we see today that are talked about in Central Europe. Well, the spirituals played a very significant role during the Great Migration and, ironically, it was not a new role. They were songs of survival and songs that allowed them to endure the hardships of life and the injustices that they faced. The spiritual evolved literally into blues, it evolved into jazz. You can always go back and trace its lineage back, back to the spiritual. And the point that it evolves in a significant way happened as we came north uh, through the migration. The lure of jobs in the North attracted all sorts of migrants. Remember, a great number of them were white Southerners. And in the 1920s, we see our first wave of Latino immigrants. Initially, young men arrived in the area to work uh, the steel mills and other heavy industry. And then in the 1960s, we had 
another influx because of agriculture. Also, the uh, phenomenon of the Cuban Revolution and over a million refugees leaving Cuba, and some of them coming to Ohio. The biggest pushback of the Great Migration came in the form of housing discrimination in the northern states. It was called redlining. Basically, it was a host of lending restrictions buried in both federal and local policies. Those policies stated who could own a home in certain parts of the city. From 1900 to 1945, African Americans were shut out of 87 newly built neighborhoods in Columbus. Oh, and the Irish, Italians, and Asians weren't welcome either. The refugee narrative that we are most familiar with comes after World War II. I started school shortly after Hitler came to power and was bullied because I was a Jew and schools were segregated by religion. So they told me that I was offending against the Son of God and my parents put me on a children's transport to Belgium. Coming to this country was, I think they considered that their blessing. To get out, to get out of Europe, because Europe at that time, especially for Jews, was a very dangerous, it was a very dangerous place. In fact, uh, except for my uh, one uncle and a cousin, we lost our entire family in the Holocaust. There was a large immigrant Jewish community that lived in Columbus, especially in that neighborhood, Fulton Street area. In those days, the synagogues were all located around there and the Jewish grocery stores were all in that area. There were approximately a quarter of a million displaced Jews after World War II. Churches and synagogues helped receive and settle thousands of displaced people every year, as they do now. There was one refugee resettlement agency in Columbus at the time, Jewish Family Services. Jewish Family Services have been around for over a hundred years. Um, you know, this, it started with the resettlement of the Eastern Europeans, uh, the Jewish community coming in. And I think the biggest value for a family is to be united. Um, when you don't have a whole family, um, I think, you know, you struggle as a society. There are now three other refugee resettlement agencies in Columbus. Community Refugee and Immigration Services, or CRIS, is the largest. So we know there's a family of 11 coming shortly, a Somali family, yeah. and finding housing will be a bit challenging for them. But so we have so far two options, which abandonment? Us Together was co-founded by Nadia Kasvin, and Tatiana Menlina. <laughs> well, I came in 1993 um, as a refugee from Ukraine. <laughs> We're a non-profit organization that is dedicated to serving refugees and immigrants. And, uh, you know, we are mutual assistance association, but not in the sense of one ethnic group for another ethnic group. It's refugees and immigrants for refugees and immigrants. We help with cradle-to-grave services, everything from um, teaching English. What's this? Bag. Helping newcomers find jobs, uh, helping them find housing, uh, getting children in school, medical screenings. I think there's a complete miss perception of the amount of financial support that they get. Um, they get very limited amount of money as a startup, $1,125.
per person, one time. These funds go towards um, uh, securing an apartment, uh, paying for rent, for uh, security deposit, for, uh, for utilities, for utility deposit, for, uh, for the phone, for maybe week worth uh, supply of food. A vast majority of our clients um, achieve total economic self-sufficiency within 180 days of entering the United States, which is amazing. The U.S. expects people to get a job very quickly. So that's one of our primary goals, is to help them become ready to work in the U.S. and to help connect them with employers who are willing to, you know, to try refugee employees. And we've had a lot of success with some local hotels and warehouses that find, you know, refugees are hard workers. They've come from such difficult circumstances. They're, they just want a new start here and are willing to work hard. Most refugees make it, but it's a constant struggle, especially for older individuals, because let's face it, learning a whole new language is harder the older you get. Anab Ali was just settling her family into a rented home when she heard news that her husband had a heart attack. She was illiterate in both Somali and English, but needed to learn to drive. <laughs> He was brought to the hospital. I was not able to visit him for lack of transportation. I called a man. I asked him how much it would take to teach me to drive. He then said, are you a young woman or an old woman? I said that I was an old woman. He said that he takes a lot of money from old women, that he takes a smaller amount from younger women with bright minds. I told him not to worry, as everybody has a God-given mind. I told him that I was an old woman with a bright mind, so he came for me. Back in 2010 and 2011 to 14, we used to have some boys I used to come here and they grab your bag, they take your keys, they take your phone, and they used to uh, come home and go through the windows and they used to take everything from them. So since as we saw that, we tried to do this self-defense for the women. The initial challenge is, was trust. Compared to where we were three years ago, um, it's tremendous. We worked as a community to um, get lights, to get a security person, to work with the administration to process eviction notices for people that needed to be evicted. So that's been great. The whole community has come out. Um, we've had, we have a garden, our, another garden. So that's another place for people to come together. The Somalis have been in Columbus since 1995, and they've had time to organize and create associations that have worked with the city and the county. Our newest arrivals are the Bhutanese Nepalis. They're just getting started organizing their community and they are vulnerable to crime and slumlords. Now we have a temple, we have a center. People come here, talk, get some information, then we can educate them. And brush down by your tongue too. We are all from Bhutan. We live in refugee camp around 17 years in Nepal. The, some of the European countries, and uh, including the United States, they decide to pick up the people from there and uh, do the resettlement. When I come to Columbus, it feels me like uh, oh, I'm living like my country. I saw a lot of like a cornfield, a lot of agricultural field, cow are grazing, 
my family my dad my mom my brother they like it okay we decide to stay in the columbus but the thing is that we are lacking of the language that is the main problem our parents our seniors they cannot go outside without the support of the anybody we organize some type of religious activities so which will give us some comfortable to our elder people our temple we have uh, programs going on every sunday we do prayers we exchange our views what should be our spiritual upbringing every year we have a program like a 3 days shrimad bhagat katha that katha gives to the people how to track in the peaceful life how we love each other how we respect to the people why we born in the earth and what we need to be do for the keeping peace and a be quiet in the family good in the neighborhood and how we get a relation with the all kind of people of the world we are evolving so that will be very welcoming for anybody to come here and share their views and the only thing you got to take off your shoes before going into the temple that jet whatever faith you have whatever society you come from whatever background you have we don't mind at all so long as you are a peace loving person you want to share your views we are very receptive to it When we talk about refugees, the exchange in our national dialogue is usually grounded in empathy, not so with immigration. Immigration, even legal immigration, is a hot button issue. It always has been, it always will be. America is a place based on immigration, based on the idea of the immigrant coming to our country. We were the new people We were the people coming to the new land, emerging with an idea that hadn't really been seen all that much before. We don't live under the rule of kings. We do not live with aristocracies and long histories based on who is related by blood to whom. We are the new people starting over with this new place. And throughout our entire history, we have been those people now occasionally as we find ourselves having lived here for some considerable period of time and look over our shoulder and then see a whole new set of people coming forward we may have some fear of the strangers in the land but we shouldn't they are us simply in the mirror looking back I thought it was important that Columbus become a welcoming city for those from outside our country. And I always have believed that a strong city is a diverse city. And so I established the New American Initiative for the purpose of engaging in in the new Americans who come to Columbus to help them figure it out uh when it comes to basic city services. when it comes to where you live, what neighborhoods. So in the beginning we held a lot of civic orientation classes at ci- civic centers, churches, schools and apartment complexes. We also did business forums and housing forums. So it was it was a holistic project, let's say. Um and today it is evolved into uh supporting and assisting citizenship training. Good afternoon. My name is Mohamed Sidibe. I'm from West Africa and I'm so proud to be a United States citizen today. Thank you. Ms. Ryder, is it true that each of these petitioners here present has been so examined and qualified? Your Honor, I'm pleased to advise that each of the petitioners here present in the court has been examined in accordance with the law and is qualified in all respects to be granted United States citizenship. We have an additional congressional seat because of our population growth. And that also is attributed to the growth and the impact of immigrant refugees in our community. 
the more we welcome people from outside of the U.S. into our intellectual capital um, laboratory, if you will, the better because that's more ideas and ideas that are often different. Some Columbus City Schools are now responding to the need for a global education. Here at the old North Columbus High School, the alumni are now taking an active role in the lives of current students. Columbus North International School is a 7 to 12 school, grade 7 to 12, and we have approximately 650 students from a variety of different cultures and nationalities. We offer seven languages in our school. French, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, German, Arabic, and Japanese. It's about getting them to think differently and to say, you know, here's issues that are going to arise during the 21st century that our kids are going to have to solve. I was actually a member of the soccer team, and in the soccer team, I believe we had people from 11 different countries on one team playing on the same field communicating, and I thought it was just, that was pretty cool. Yeah, our students actually, when they graduate, not only have the languages, um, but they have that global awareness. They have that international background. You know how, like, before you learn about other cultures, you think all the stereotypes are true and all that? When I came here, I learned that that wasn't true. We are a partnership. The kids are great kids. The whole atmosphere of the school is just wonderful. We're just thrilled to death to have them here. And they'll be here hopefully forever. A lot of parents have said to me that this is a, a real world school. When you go out into the real world, you interact with a lot of different people. The Morris Road Corridor is undergoing a different kind of revitalization than we've seen thus far in our neighborhood series. When Northland Mall failed and the jobs dried up, the area became an eyesore. City and county leaders invested in some beautification, but the big turnaround came when Somalis and Latinos took advantage of cheap rent and set up businesses. The area sometimes looks like Guadalajara, or per perhaps parts of it may, may look like some businesses in Mogadishu, but there is business being created, there is money that's ch is changing hands, and people are living in that neighborhood and are contributing to the economy of Central Ohio. Historically, immigrants have been entrepreneurs, and that's no different today. Between 2006 and 2010, more than 20,000 new immigrant-owned businesses generated a total of more than $1.3 billion. My name is Lisa Gutierrez, and I'm the owner of Dos Hermanos Taco Truck, along with my husband. <laughs> uh, my husband's from Oaxaca, Mexico, and these are his grandmother's and mother's recipes. ECDI has been a big part of the success that we've seen already with Dos Hermanos. As we grew, we needed things that we couldn't necessarily already afford, and they have the food fort, uh, which is powered by ECDI and the Women's Business Center. You know, in order to start a business or even expand a business, you need capital. So that's when we became a lender. We've deployed $28 million in loan capital throughout the state of Ohio. We create jobs through individuals starting businesses or expanding their businesses. I think my vision was to help others. You know, when people come to this country for opportunities. Unfortunately, oftentimes, people don't have the type of knowledge to take advantage of those opportunities. So when I started thinking about how do we help other immigrants or even people who work in the United States start businesses, education, that's what came to mind. I mean, that's what's really important is to teach others how do you take an idea and make it a business. Without the city of Columbus and Franklin County, we would not be where we are. They very much care about economic development. They care very much about community development. They care about job creation. The entrepreneur spirit um, it's all runs within me. And um, you know, it's rewarding to see that people enjoy the food that we make and they're interested in where the food comes from and where the recipes come from. And it gives my husband an opportunity to talk about uh, where he came from. 
as Columbus becomes more and more diverse, we have neighbors come from all around the world and bring all this amazing food with them. When you want to learn about other people, you usually start off with their cuisine first and then you, you, you go from there. Food is a great way to find common ground with people because eating is something that we all do. And so if you go and you try someone's food, it's a, a very good way to, to forge a, an initial bond. There's a lot of cuisines, you know, that we're very familiar with. You know, Chinese food has been around in the United States for, you know, 100 years and people have had a chance to grow up with it. But when you are presented with a, an ethnic cuisine like, you know, Ghanaian or Kenyan, you just don't know what to expect. You know, it may be you don't know what to order, you don't know what's going to be good. The look of the restaurant or the name is unfamiliar. We serve authentic, original Ethiopian food. Everything is natural, and we get our recipe, everything that we use from back home. We cook Somali food inspired by my mom's recipes from back home. We have a lot of diversity customers who come to us and taste our food, and they, they like it and they come back. The food we do it here is for everybody, not, not only Senegalese people, because I have a lot of customers from here. I have a lot of customers from the other part of Africa too. We give them friendship, service, great food. The more people who visit a restaurant from outside of its original community it really helps those restaurant owners feel welcome and feel at home and feel part of the wider community in Columbus. It took the Germans, the Irish, and the Italians generations to weave their stories into the fabric of Columbus. How long will it take our new Americans? Who knows? But what is certain is that the world is a much smaller place, and it seems the pace of change is much quicker. Remember Anab Ali? She's trying to launch a small business sewing reusable grocery bags out of scrap material. And Medino Kali hopes that a good education will launch her daughter's future. I think it is very important, regardless if it is ethnicity, uh, origins, or, or gender, uh, to have somebody that you can identify with, because you see how that you don't have any limitations, you can see that you can make it. It is not an impossible dream, that is something that you can pursue and achieve. My mom, you know, looking at her and her success and what she's gone through, like coming from Iran into America, a world where she didn't know the language, she didn't know traditions or the culture. She came in and she made America her home. Because she's, you know, so successful in her career and is a good speaker and is outgoing and is confident in what she wears, that really inspires me to be just like her. I would like to say thank you, America. You know, today I'm here and, and I already became a U.S. citizen. I'll be voting for the president and I'm proud to be a U.S. Uh, citizen. I live here since 1997. I meet a lot of good people, give me a lot of help. Columbus make me more successful in my life. I was lucky that my parents left before the war. I was lucky that I'm in a position that I'm in now where I was educated here, I went to school here, I went to college here. So if I can be a little bit of a helping hand to guide them through that, then they can do the same for the next new person that comes in or the next new family that comes in. Um, you know, it's just kind of like paying that forward. I think one of the main challenges is because as a Somali, we're very traditional people and we would like to keep that wherever we go. And that could be a little bit challenging for, you know, the locals to know these people. I have a one job, I pay my bills, I support my family, and I still have a good time to go see the Bakai or the crew games and go all the festivals and do everything else. The people. I love the people. Very friendly, cool people. I like the lifestyle. I don't like winter times, but I try to survive and not to think about it and, you know, sit home, eat so much and watch all the Netflix movies. All of it. You are so Ohioan now. I am a Bakai. Yes.
This is Stefan and he's going to attempt to teach me how to greet somebody in Mandarin Chinese. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Hao. Ni hao. Mm -hmm. It literally translates into, you are good. To say hi in Moroccan, we say salamu alaikum. Instead of hello, namaste. <laughs> Setai. Setai. Yeah, and that's very, is that, it's like you can say that at any time, anyone. anywhere, to anyone. Is that sort of like saying, hey? Yeah. Yeah, howdy. Howdy, neighbor. Is it ear kisses like with Heidi Klum on Project no. Runway? Okay, no. all right. If you do ear kissing, that's impolite. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Yeah. So, salam. Chatori. 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 Yeah. Chatori. Thank you. Xiao Shi Bu You're very welcome. <laughs> Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. Since 1921, the State Auto Group has called Columbus Neighborhoods home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. American Electric Power Foundation, a resource for charitable initiatives and communities served by AEP and beyond to improve people's lives through education, basic needs, healthcare, and the arts. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you. Thank you. Columbus Neighborhoods New Americans is available on DVD. Log on to WOSU.org slash shop for details.